responsibility in it. Bless as I teach and preach your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. If you are here today and you're not saved, I'm telling you the gospel, this church wasn't started just so we'd have fellowships, though we do. We have fun times and fellowships. That's not why our church was started. The church was started to get the gospel to you. The church was started to tell you that there is a God in heaven who loves you, who sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to this earth to pay the price on an old rugged cross for your sins. Jesus died for you. He was buried for you. He rose again for you, and he'll save you and forgive you today if you'll call on him. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you'll call on Jesus Christ, believing on him as your Savior, he will save you. So at the end of this service, if you're here and you're not saved, you can be saved. The gospel's for you. It's called gospel. It means good news, and it is good news. That the God in heaven loves you enough to pay the price for your sins so you could be saved and have eternal life. Well, the gospel, Paul and Silas had preached that in Philippi, to the church at Philippi. And then they had gone to Thessalonica and begun the church there. They just preached for a few brief weeks. But in those few brief weeks... Already believers, people turn to Christ, they're believers. And here Paul is writing to them and he said, verse 5, Our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. Well, how did it come in power? The Bible says the gospel of God is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Say, Pastor, I don't feel like a powerful Christian. I'm going to tell you how to be a powerful Christian. Share the gospel. Give the gospel to somebody else. Look, you ought to have the gospel ready in your heart and on your lips, ready to tell somebody else what Christ did for you. I wonder, did you share the gospel with anybody this week? We have the gospel in printed form on thousands of tracts, and we'll print thousands more and thousands more and thousands more. I'm telling you, we have a responsibility to get the gospel, the good news, to those around us. Well, the church in Thessalonica, the people were saved. And notice what he says, uh, verse 7, he said, Ye were in samples, ye got saved, and already, even though you're young in the faith, you're already an example. Notice verse 7, Ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God were to spread abroad. And notice that was even in the midst of persecution. Verse 6 says they received the word in much affliction. Even though they were being afflicted and persecuted, they received the word. And they became examples to others. By the way, you're a brand new Christian. Don't say, I'll wait until I'm an old, gray-haired Christian to be an example. No, you be an example right now. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word and doctrine and faith and spirit and charity and purity. You be an example. It doesn't matter how long you've been saved. You be an example. The right kind of example. And notice what he said from you, verse 8, sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God were to spread abroad, church at Thessalonica, so that we need not to speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Keep reading in chapter 2, verse 1. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. Certainly it wasn't. They turned from idols to serve the living and true God. Verse 2. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as ye know, at Philippi. Remember Acts 16, where they were beaten and put in the prison. We were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God. He said, we didn't let that stop us. We didn't let a little persecution, affliction, and jail time for Christ slow us down. We came and preached the gospel to you with much contention. Verse 3, for our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. And folks, that's what we as a church want to be. We're not here to be seeker-sensitive. We're here to be Savior-sensitive. We're here to want to please God. Verse 5, for neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. He said, we didn't come flattering you. We didn't come telling you what you want to hear. We didn't come trying to get in your pocketbook. Verse 6, nor of men sought we glory. We weren't looking for applause from men. Neither of you nor yet of others when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, 
because ye were dear unto us. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail. Now, don't miss this. This is the crux of the first part of this message. Ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail. For laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. If you continue reading in 1 Thessalonians and other scriptures that comment on this passage, the church in Thessalonica didn't give anything towards their own spiritual growth financially. Uh, Paul came from Philippi to Thessalonica. He preached the gospel. The church in Thessalonica, they're brand new baby Christians. You know, it's kind of like a, a child, physically speaking, a child. A child doesn't, when they're 7, 8, 10 years old, they don't prepare financially for the parents, right? The parents should take care of the children. Well, here the church in Thessalonica, they're children spiritually, and they're, they're brand new believers. And so the church in Thessalonica, they didn't support the Apostle Paul financially. They didn't support Silas financially. And by the way, be careful. Look, I, I know when I talk about money, I'm talking about one of the gods of our nation, one of the gods, and people get nervous. And another reason people get nervous when a preacher talks about money is because there are so many preachers fleecing the sheep. There are so many preachers who are dishonest, and they are in it for the money. They're in it for, it's a business to them. So they do, they're just invested in telling people what they want to hear to keep the offerings big. And hey, so then they, you know, it's like the preacher who, I don't know if you, any of you saw this not long ago. There, literally, this happened. A preacher was yelling at the congregation because they didn't buy him a $4,000 watch. How many of you saw that? Anybody? Yeah, a few of you saw that. I'm saying, I'm thinking, what are those people doing still sitting in that congregation? You know, go, go find a place where the preacher's a sincere man of God, preaching the word of God. Help him get the gospel out. Uh, you know, I'm not against, if, if you can afford a $4,000 watch for yourself, wonderful. But again, there, there's so many preachers with that mentality, or the one not long ago who said, I, you know, I feel God's led me to buy a second private jet. How many of you read about that one? That's absolutely true. You know, God's leading us to buy a second private jet for the preacher. Um, folks, so I understand when I talk about money, or when God's Word talks about money, we can get nervous because there's a lot of false preaching. But what I'm preaching to you this morning, I just say to you, go to the Word of God and see if it's so. See if this is biblically true, the things I'm saying this morning, and how we should be when it comes to giving. Here in 1 Thessalonians 2, the church in Thessalonica, they're brand new believers. They're not giving financially. They're not supporting the work, the missionary work of the Apostle Paul. So how in the world could Paul afford to go to the church in Thessalonica? I mean, look, preachers have to live on, you know, have food too. They, they have to have things to take care of themselves. Well, what did Paul do? One, he made tents. He worked with his own hands and he worked hard and made tents. But secondly, there was another church that while Paul was preaching the gospel in Thessalonica, this other church was supporting him financially. Who was that church? We'll go to the book of Philippians, chapter 4. And what I'm telling you is what we're seeing here is a pattern. This is God's missions program. Philippians, chapter 4. While Paul was in Thessalonica, he didn't one time mention to those new believers, hey, I need you to help support me financially so I can get the gospel to you like I'm doing. He didn't. He worked with his own hands, but what else did he do? There was another church church at Philippi who supported him. Philippians chapter 4. In fact, the book of Philippians, remember Paul and Silas were in jail in what city? Philippi. Okay, so they were there and that's, the, that's where he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's when he said that to the Philippian jailer. And so while Paul now is in Thessalonica, after he's left Philippi, the church in Philippi says, hey, Paul's getting the gospel out. Let's help him financially to get the gospel out to Thessalonica. So look at Philippians 4.10. Paul says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me, speaking to the church at Philippi, hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. He said, you were concerned for me. You, want, you were full of care for me. You wanted to help me, but you didn't have the opportunity. You, you wanted to give more than you could, but you, you didn't have the opportunity, but now you have and then Paul said, by the way, not that I speak in respect of want, I'm not lacking. He says, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. 
I have learned, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. But notice he had to learn that to be content. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Notwithstanding, church at Philippi, ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. That word communicate, we use it in the Bible about speaking, but when the Bible speaks of communicating, it's talking about giving. In fact, listen to 1 Timothy 6, 17. The Bible says, Charge them that are rich in this world. Who are the rich in this world? That's Bill Gates. Yeah, he's rich. Well, financially anyway. Uh, Jeff Bezos, he's rich. Folks, I'm going to tell you who the rich in this world are. It's the people in this room. I don't feel rich. I, I didn't say you do, and I know you don't. And I know the standards in America are far higher than many other places in the world. Uh, but do you remember when, what was it, uh, Khrushchev, Nikita Khrushchev from the USSR, he came to America, and they brought him into an American grocery store, and he saw foods of all kinds all over the shelves, and he laughed. How many of you have you read this or heard this? He laughed because he thought we were, we were staging the store. Like, look, it's so good in America that we have all these different foods. And it was just a store. Folks, what I'm telling you is many people who come here walk into our stores and go, how in the world do you have such choices of all this food? What I'm telling you is we're rich. How many of you have dropped off bags to Goodwill or you need to? <laughs> what I'm telling you is we're rich. <laughs> How many of you went to a little faucet and turned on water and it was either hot or cold? We're rich. How many of you went to a little box and pushed some buttons and you got some air to blow on you, cool air or hot air this week? We're rich. How many of you got here on a vehicle? So yeah, but yeah, but my vehicle is terrible. But you have a vehicle. We're rich. I know we don't feel rich because the standard in America and in our world has been set such that covetousness is a big deal. There's always something else we have to have. So we don't feel rich, but if we really stop and examine things, folks, we're rich. So when he says, charge them that are rich in this world, don't think of Jeff Bezos. Don't think of Bill Gates. Think of yourself. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches. By the way, that's a good place to be, where you're not trusting in uncertain riches. Well, if the stock market's up, I'm going to praise God. Say, what's the stock market? Some of you say that, right? Not in uncertain riches, but in the living God. Have you, have, do you remember the last time you really had to trust God day in and day out? But in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. And then notice what he said else he were to charge them to do. That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. What does that mean? Willing to give. Laying up, why? Notice, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. He said we ought to lay up in store treasure that will not fade away. Hebrews 13, 16 says, To do good and to communicate, speaking of giving, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Paul said to the church in Philippians, uh, Philippi, verse 14, he said, Ye have well done, that ye did communicate with my affliction. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia... No church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. Now look at verse 16. For even in, what, what's the city? Thessalonica. Ye sent once and again unto my necessity. How could Paul do what he did in Thessalonica, get the gospel to the church in Thessalonica? How could he do it? God used another church to provide his need. God used Paul's own hands to work, and he used another church to provide for the missionary Paul. Notice what he says, verse 17. Not because I desire a gift. But I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Can I ask you a question? Those people saved in Thessalonica, does that count reward-wise for the church in Philippi? It absolutely does. Because the church in Philippi gave that the church in Thessalonica might hear the gospel. And this is God's plan, to give. To give financially. Say, Pastor, I'm not rich. We are the rich of this world. I say, I can't give. We all have something we can give. 
Everybody does. Everybody. Sometimes it's just a matter of realigning our priorities. That's often what it is. Realigning our priorities. Um, Verse 18, Paul said, But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice, acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need. Now notice, he'll supply our need, not our greed, according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He said he'd supply our needs. Do you believe that? You believe that? Who's he speaking to? A church that gave of themselves so the gospel could go forth in another place. By the way, we're going to see here briefly. In fact, let's go there now. Look at 2 Corinthians 9. 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 through 8. You know, the terrible thing about sitting here is there's a glare on the clock, and I can't see the clock. I do have a watch, though, but I really can't. There's a glare on the clock from this angle. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6. He's speaking of giving. Now, this applies to many things, but it's talking about giving. He says, This I say, He which soweth or planteth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. And what's the next word? Every. How many of us are part of every? Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly. Oh, pastor's preaching on money this morning. I have to give. You know what? It's between you and God. Say, if I give more, do you get a raise? No, I don't get more because you give. I'll tell you what we will do. We'll support more missionaries. We'll run more buses. We'll print more gospel tracts. We'll send out more gospel mailers. That's what will happen. So let him give, not grudgingly. Oh, I've got to give. Or of necessity. Well, there's a need. Nobody else is going to do it. For God loveth a cheerful giver. You know why God loves a cheerful giver? Because he is a cheerful giver. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And he loves a cheerful giver. You think God said, well, those old sinners, well, I have to send my son. Well, nobody else is going to do it, so it better be me. No, he wanted us to be saved. Notice verse 8, it says, And God is able to make all grace abound towards you. That ye always having all sufficiency, in other words, having enough, in all things may abound to every good work. Uh, I don't have time to read it, but Matthew 6, let's just turn there. We need to see it. Matthew 6, the very last verse in the chapter, or actually the second to the last verse rather, says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. And then he talks about our needs. He talks about food and clothing and how God knows we need those things. And then notice in the very beginning of this passage what he says in verse 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Well, how do you lay up treasures in heaven? I mean, do you send gold ahead? What, what, what do you do? There's only one thing I can think of. Souls. People who who need the gospel. People who are going to come to you in heaven and say, Hey, you don't know me, but you gave to that missionary and they reached me. Hey, you don't don't remember me, but you knocked on my door. Hey, you don't remember me, but you ran a bus by my house. You may not remember me, but you were in the store and you handed me one of those little pieces of paper about Jesus. You called him a tract, I think. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt. Let me ask you a question. We talked about this in Sunday school. On your deathbed, if Jesus tarries and and you go to heaven by way of death, what are you going to want around your deathbed? Collections of things? A nice car? I'm not saying don't have a nice car. I'm not saying don't enjoy things. The biblical biblical, uh, balance is you ought to enjoy the things God gives to you. That's biblical. biblical. But ask yourself, when I get to that moment, am I going to want to have had just you know, the best house in the neighborhood? Is that what's going to really matter to me? 
the best car, the, the, the finest clothes, everything. That's what's really going to matter to me. Bury me in my best suit. No, I'll tell you what you're going to want. You're going to want some people around you. People you've influenced for Christ, for goodness, for righteousness. That's what you're going to want. Hey, when you get to heaven, what you're going to want? Some people, some souls. As Paul said, ye are our crown of rejoicing. This is what he's talking about. When he says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Notice there's no, there's no uh, interruption of this truth. It doesn't matter who you are. It says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Wherever your treasure is, what's your main treasure? I'll tell you your main treasure is time. Treasure in your finances. They're, they're very closely related. What you do with your time is very similar usually to what you do with your finances. Your abilities, your talents, time, talent, treasure. How are you investing those things? The church in Thessalonica, they got the gospel coming their way because the church in Philippi said, hey, let's support Paul. Let's support Paul. By the way, was the church in Philippi rich? No, they weren't. As a matter of fact, we're going to see. Look at 2 Corinthians 8. The church in Philippi, the church in Thessalonica, and the church in Berea. They're all part of the churches of Macedonia. We're going to read here in 2 Corinthians 8, 1. None of them were wealthy as far as financially wealthy. Most, or not most, all of them had been persecuted. All of them. And all of them were struggling just to survive. But notice 2 Corinthians 8, 1. He says, moreover, brethren, now he's writing to the church at Corinth which is in southern Greece, he says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Who is that? Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. What does that mean? Even through their deep poverty, they were very liberal in giving of themselves and what they had. Verse 3, for to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves. Hey, I'd love to give you $50, Paul, for Thessalonica, but I have 10. Take 10. Verse 4, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Notice, and this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Now, don't miss this. Don't miss this. Paul was in Philippi, preaching the gospel. The Philippian jailer gets saved. He goes to Thessalonica. He doesn't put any financial burden on the church in Thessalonica. Why? How can he do that? Because he's working with his own hands. And secondly, because the church in Philippi is supporting him. But now notice, this occurs after he has come to the church in Thessalonica. Who is now giving? All of the churches in Macedonia. So now, Philippi, Berea, but also Thessalonica. So now they are growing up spiritually to the place where they're saying, you know what, the gospel came to us. Someone invested in us. The church at Philippi invested in Paul so Paul could bring the gospel to us. And now we're going to invest so Paul can get the gospel to Corinth. Here's the point. Someone invested so that the gospel could come to you. Somebody started a bus, bought a bus, insured the bus, fueled the bus, changed out the bus tires. They're expensive, by the way. <laughs> One bus tire, some, some of the, the steer wheel, they call them drive wheels or steer, I forget, I'm out of practice. $375. One tire. Is it worth it? Look at the people around here who have been saved through a bus ministry. Is it worth it? <laughs> Someone left their home behind in the United States, flew to a foreign nation where they're dodging the government, hiding from the cameras, wherever their letter is. Is it worth it? We send them support every month. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? It's worth it. Someone gives to keep the lights on. So people can come here and get saved. People in this room, you got saved in this room. Is it worth it? It's worth it. Somebody gave so we could print gospel tracts. 
just printed 5,000 more, going to print 2,500 more in the next week, and just printed 7,500 more gospel mailers. Say, that's a lot of tracts. It is, and we need more. Is it worth it? It's worth it. What I'm saying is the church in Thessalonica, they were baby Christians. The church at Philippi was supporting Paul so the gospel could get to them. Now in 2 Corinthians 8, even though financially they are in deep straits themselves, they're saying we want to give more. And they are giving so that the gospel can go to Corinth. Someone invested so that the gospel could come to you. Now don't let that investment stop with you. What are you going to do so the gospel can go from you to the next soul? From you to the next city. From you to the next country. God's plan is give, give, give. Who should give? All of us. If you're here and you're lost, I'm not talking to you. You're the reason we need to give. If you're here and you're lost, I don't, wanna, I don't want you to give a dime of your money because I don't want you to think that you're giving to earn your way to heaven. You can never earn your way to heaven. Amen. Jesus' blood shed on an old rugged cross is the only price that can be paid for your sin. For your soul. I don't want you to give a dime lest you think that somehow you're buying your way because you'll never buy your way. You could give all you own to the offering of the church and you could still die and go straight to hell. The only price sufficient is the blood of Christ. But for all of us who are believers, we should all be giving of ourselves that the gospel may go forth. But that's one half of God's plan. Give, 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 and go. 1 Thessalonians 1 again, please. We're going to finish with this. 1 Thessalonians 1. He said to the church in Thessalonica, He said, The gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power. I'll say. They turned from serving idols to serving the living and true God. And not only that, but notice now they are in samples. They, their testimony is going forth. Notice verse 7, he says, So that ye, church in Thessalonica, were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord. Paul said, I brought the gospel to you, but it didn't stop with you. Now it's sounding out from you to somebody else. That's God's plan. Give and go. Give and go. Say, I'm not called to go to China. Maybe you are. Maybe you should plan to go and then God can stop you. But I'll tell you this, you're, you are called to go. You are called to go. Just as we are all called to give, we are all called to go. It might be to your neighbor next door. It is to your neighbor. It might be to your family at the family reunion. It might be to the man who works next to you on the line at work. Or it might be that God calls you to uproot your family and go to a foreign land. It might be. But whatever it is, he has called us all to go. Church in Thessalonica, he said, gospel came to you, but now you're in samples. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God were to spread abroad. Would God, it could be said that every person who works a job in this church, that they, people walk into your workplace and they say, yeah, oh, oh yeah, we know so-and-so, they're always telling others about Jesus. Oh, they're always saying something about the Bible. Now, they may not say it in a favorable way, but some will. Would God, it could be said that we are turning our world upside down or right side up. Matthew 9, 36 through 38, Jesus, the Bible says, said, The harvest truly is plenteous. What harvest is he talking about? Wheat, barley, rye? No, he's talking about souls. The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. In John, Jesus said, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. As you leave church today, just drive down the road and look in the face of every person you pass and realize they're going to spend eternity in heaven or hell. Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest, and he that reapeth receiveth wages. I'm concerned that God will take care of my needs. He promised he'd take care of your needs. 
He promised he would. What I'm talking about are eternal rewards. He that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. 1 Corinthians 3 says, He that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. What did Jesus say? Mark 16, 15, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What does that mean? Go on purpose, but also as you go, everywhere you go, preach the gospel. You may go to eat somewhere today, and there's some soul God's going to bring across your path. They have a soul. You're going to go to heaven or hell. Will you speak to them a word about Jesus Christ? Will you hand them a gospel tract? You know, it's just as easy to hand a gospel tract to somebody as it is to hand them a dollar bill or a debit card. You, know, you don't even have to be that spiritual in how you do it. You can still be a little scared and do it. Okay? Say, say, here, can I trade you? This is what I do. Sometimes somebody give you a receipt. Can I trade you? Here, let me give you an invitation. See, it, you can do it. You can do it. There's no reason we can't go with the gospel today. What would happen? I just wanted to ask. What would happen? And I don't know. This is between you and God. It's between me and God. What would happen if every person in this room said, I'm going to take God's mission plan seriously. I'm going to give and I'm going to go. I'm going to give of that which God has entrusted to me for the furtherance of the gospel of Christ, of my treasure, my time, and my talents, and I'm going to go. I'm going to go into all the world preaching the gospel to every creature, and it may be God actually calls me and places me somewhere, but I'm going to take God's plan seriously. I will give and I will go. What would happen if every believer in this church took that seriously and said, I'm going to do that? I'm going to tell you what would happen. We would see the world turned right side up. We would hear people saying, those who filled that place with their doctrine, they've come here also. That's what would happen. Let's get serious about God's plan. Give and go. Let's bow our heads together, please. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. As I've said, if you're here and you're lost, I'm not even talking to you yet about giving and going. You are the reason Christians need to give and go. If you're here and you're lost, you need to be saved. What I'm telling you is there's a God who loves you so much that he sent his only begotten son to this earth to take your place, to pay for your sins on the old rugged cross. He died for you. He was buried for you. He rose again. He took the punishment of your sins for you so that you can be forgiven, so that you can have salvation. He wants to save you today. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. No one's looking around who would say, Pastor, that's me. I am not saved. I am concerned about my own soul. If I were to die today, I'm not sure I'd go to heaven. Please pray for me. I need to be saved. Lift your hand now if that's you. Lift your hand quietly until I see it. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Heads are still bowed, eyes are still closed. Who would say, Pastor, I know I'm saved. Someone invested and got the gospel to me. And I want to thank God that I am saved. I want to thank him for his grace, for the price he paid and for the price others paid to get the gospel to me. Here's my hand. I want to thank the Lord. If that's you, would you lift your hand? Thank him. Don't ever get over it. Don't ever get over it. Heads are still bowed. Eyes are still closed. My head is bowed. My eyes are closed. Who would say, dear Lord, I'm going to take your plan seriously. The gospel came to me. It shouldn't stop with me. It came to me and it needs to go to someone else. You didn't give me the gospel just to save me and give me a home in heaven and not to tell anybody else. You gave me the gospel so I could be saved, but so I could spread it to someone who needs it. So, Lord, here's my hand. I'm going to take seriously your command to give and to go. Here's my hand. If that's you, would you lift your hand to the Lord? Commit it to him. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Bless it to our hearts. I pray that we'll see the fruit of these decisions. Lord, in the days and years to come, as many more souls are saved because 
The people here took your plan seriously to give and to go. Lord, it may be there are even someone here, some here that you are calling them to go to a foreign land, to give of their life somewhere else so the gospel can go forth. I pray that they will yield that to you even now. In Jesus' name. Let's stand to our feet.